Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. With us today, Daniel McAdams, our co-host. Daniel, good to see you this morning. Is it still raining? No thunder, no thunder. <laughs> Where's my intro? We better get our 30 minutes in in two minutes. <laughs> I paid <laughs> maybe, for that thunder. Maybe if we talk faster, we can get more information out. <laughs> but they might not understand. <laughs> but anyway, we have important things to talk about. Yeah. And if somebody wrote an article today, bring back some memories. It and does. We, we have to have to sort of dissect this out because uh, for somehow or another, my name has been associated with the Tea Party movement. Yes. And uh, I think there's some misunderstanding, even back early on, how it got started and what it meant and how long did it last and what did the Republicans think of it? What did the, the, uh, what, what did the military industrial complex yeah. think about it? So it was a big deal. But here we come across an article in Politico. We've been using Politico more often lately. Yeah, like we have. So, yeah. Well, if they present something that sounds like they're making an effort to give us some news and truth, uh, I think that's what we should do. But th this article, uh, it looks like it might be one of their main articles, and it heads up, of course, the subject is, uh, you, you, you know, timely because it has to do with the uh, speaker and the speaker deciding not to be speaker anymore yeah. after he lost a vote. Okay, Kevin McCarthy's downfall, this is the title in Politico, is the is, downfall is the culmination of the Tea Party. Now, I need to protect myself because I had been associated once with them. Uh, and some people have a different interpretation than others, but uh, they, they, they're, since my name is tied to that, I have to find out whether I need to defend myself. Yeah. Uh, uh, who, who, who is the Tea Party? I thought nobody was talking about it. And I guess for some people, they don't want to talk about it. But let me just make a few comments on how I remember the Tea Party started. And it wasn't a political decision. I didn't have an idea about, oh, well, it's, a, it's a, you know, emphasize the Tea Party movement and, and emphasize what we were doing in our campaign. No, it didn't happen that way. There was no one key person in our campaign that came up with this idea. Uh, but anyway, it was very, very spontaneous. People started talking about it at rallies, and uh, and off it went. It was a, it was a big deal. But it reminds me sort of how the campaign worked. That, that sort of is what happened on the money issue. Is uh, uh, we uh, uh, we didn't start with end the Fed, end the yeah. Fed, the, and it, that came from the college students who started recognizing me talking about the Fed and they came up with the slogan, and the Fed, and the Fed. And you know, also the fundraising was sort of, sort of a spontaneous totally, thing too. Yeah. And, and we did quite well. And that satisfied me because uh, I wasn't that anxious to make uh, calls and convert all the rich people to uh, libertarianism. <laughs> so that didn't happen. But this is, this is uh, interesting because uh, of the Tea Party thing. Now they have the picture they have on here that is to symbolize the Tea Party. And, uh, and that, that is McCarthy, Paul Ryan, and Eric Cantor. You know, what do they call themselves? The uh, Party of Movement and the, the Young you know, Guns. The Young Guns, they uh, yeah. were running the show, oh, but yeah. each one of them faded pretty quickly. And uh, this is, uh, of course, uh, McCarthy, not as quickly, but uh, he didn't last long when he finally got the position of power. Yeah. And uh, I think it's interesting to think about how this went on. And I think I mentioned something to you is I was looking at this and how it came about what, uh, be because of the miscellaneous uh, 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 arguments for what they really believed in, it was sort of a, a distor distorted ideas of interventionism and conservatism and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, that, that was hard to define. It wasn't like we have a definition of non-interventionism in foreign policy, nothing like that. It turns out, at one point I'd like us to try to make today, is uh, the more I read about what happened the last couple of days, the more convinced I get that, you know, foreign policy is a big deal and for us in a positive way because uh, you know people are panicking oh my goodness 
the money the money is the, the it's almost like the money for for ukraine is is like uh the bill of rights you know if, if this goes so this is this is very fascinating uh and and i think it's a shame because i think there's a lot of mixed understanding about what what was going on with the tea party movement and uh and, and and where where we come in although we never shied away from it but we were anxious to try to define ourselves about the tea party and and what it meant and that was sort of the constitutional limited government libertarian views and monetary policy and uh, that's what i believe because the people and the students i was talking to they helped and they stimulated this and created this this movement and uh if somebody said well why don't you describe what you think they were doing and why was the tea party established and your name attached to it uh see that's a different story because it didn't take long when i heard whispers well yeah it sounds good but we have to we have to deal with this foreign policy thing you know mm -hmm. because they have heard about it. so uh but it's it's fascinating it came and went but what I'm hoping for and what I'll work for is to make sure that the image and the beliefs and the momentum and the ideology of what we were talking about is worthwhile defining and preserving. Yeah, and this is the article we're talking about on Politico today, if we can put that first one up. Uh, this is Kevin McCarthy's downfall is the culmination of the Tea Party. We both it caught our, both of our attention, Dr. Paul, and what it essentially is in an interview with Theda Skokpol. Now, she's a political scientist at Harvard, Dr. Paul, so I'm sure she knows way more than we do about the Tea Party and everything else. She's an expert on it, in fact, and that's how she is described in the article, in the interview. So I looked at this article. The first thing I did when I saw the Tea Party is I did a little word search. Go to the next one. I did a little word search for Ron Paul and it came up as zero. <laughs> so they wrote an entire article about the culmination of the Tea Party, and it did not I include the words Ron Paul in it. And I thought, well, hmm, let's go back down the history memory hole. And I went and I did a little bit of Googling, Dr. Paul, and hold on one second. And so I went to an, a magazine that is not known for being pro-Ron Paul or pro-libertarian, and that is The Atlantic. And they came out with an article in 2010. So according to, according to uh, Theta Skokpol of Harvard, the Tea Party has nothing to do with Ron Paul. According to The Atlantic, which has always hated Ron Paul, let's go to the next one, November 2010, Ron Paul, the Tea Party's brain. So apparently you're the Tea Party's brain according to even your enemies. But now when we talk about the Tea Party with the Harvard professor, you're not. And here's the opening article from Joshua Green, uh, the opening of the 2010 Atlantic. One way to measure the surprising rightward political lurch, okay, they'll say that, of the past two years, and the rise of the Tea Party is to chart the relative position of Ron Paul, who has never flinched from his beliefs. He's not alone anymore. That's all you <laughs> need to know about what it was before good old Theta was interviewed by Politico yesterday. Now, the conclusion by some, probably not in that article, and after explaining what you said, he has to go. We <laughs> yeah. got to get rid of this guy. <laughs> yeah, so. absolutely. Well, here's more from the, I just want to like refresh people's memory. And here's more from the Atlantic article, if you can put the next one on, because I think it's important to remember this. Um, so. Paul is also a loner because his ambitions lie mostly beyond Washington. He wants to inspire a national movement, but from the outside. And this is all from the article about Ron Paul as the brain of the Tea Party. Like Obama, Paul inspires people of widely varying beliefs to see him as a vessel of their desires. His opposition to the Iraq War, strident criticism of the Federal Reserve, and early warnings of financial collapse, which he derived from the theories of semi-obscure Austrian economists, brought all sorts of people into the fold. Important to remember how it brought all sorts of people into the fold. And if, I, if you'll indulge me a little bit more, Dr. Paul, if we can go to the next one. From that same 2010 Politico article, it talks about the clearest sign of this, of, of, i.e. of you bringing all sorts of people together. The clearest signs of this 
is the loose affiliation of angry conservatives, disaffected independents, Glenn Beck disciples, strict constitutionalists, and assorted malcontents who gather under the Tea Party banner. That captures exactly as we all, we both remember it, as everyone involved remember it. But going back to present time and our favorite Harvard expert on the Tea Party, Dr. Paul, if we look at the next one, it wasn't about all of that. She says, it was never about cutting the deficit. The popular side of the Tea Party was about anger and fear of a changing country in which a guy with Hussein as his middle name and black skin could be elected president. So, Dr. Paul, <laughs> the Tea Party wasn't about you. It wasn't about grassroots. It was sur purely about racism. Well, I can't remember calling her up and thanking her for the fair article. <laughs> but that, the way you were just reading it, she said, I said, I think I'd root for that guy. Yeah. <laughs> she sounds pretty good to me. But, uh, no, and I, and I think... Uh, the biggest problem for people to really understand it, and, and to me it's important, and I think for promoting ideas it's important, is how it got started. It was spontaneous, which I encourage, and it was a reflection of young people who were taking what I was saying in the philosophy and, 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 and interpreted it into a political action. The same thing, you know, happened with, uh, with the ending of the Fed. They were the ones who started shouting, end the Fed, end the Fed, uh, after just hearing the story about this. So it's, uh, it's, to, it's to me a, a wonderful thing on, on how it started, and, uh, but then, then it was taken over quickly, you know, a afterwards. As a matter of fact, uh, that, you said that was in 2010. That was 2010, yeah. yeah. How come you never showed me that article? <laughs> <laughs> I just <laughs> found it. <laughs> so, a good article. Uh, uh, no, that's, that's wonderful. That's why, you know, sometimes we overly complain and put everybody in a basket, but some of them deserve it, you know, yeah. that we hear nothing. But uh, there's, there's things out there. Th uh, but, but quite frankly, I think we had more freedoms in 2010 than we have now yeah. when it comes to... Uh, 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 you know, uh, the First Amendment rights, and we might talk about that in a little bit, that, that it's been restrained. But it did change. Uh, and the Republicans, the only thing I sensed that I knew was going on was, you know, I was out, of, I wasn't campaigning, so the activity was changing. I was doing uh, more average things. And uh, they, they, all, all of a sudden I found out, I talked to Republicans in, Republicans, you yeah. know, they were they were grabbing a hold of this, and I said, "Well, is that a compliment?" Not really. Yeah. What they're doing is they're usurping the ability. One time, one time when we had this uh, spontaneous fundraiser, we raised six million dollars a night, which was a, a record, bit of a yeah. record. And I had a, a, a Democratic, uh, no, a Republican friend, conservative, who generally was voting with me on most of the issues. He came over and sat down uh, beside me. And uh, he said, uh, he says, uh, t tell me, tell me how you do this. What, what is your <laughs> program? And, and it was, you know, they wanted to explain how, where did I get this computer knowledge yeah. you know, <laughs> to be able to manage this? And, uh, you know, we were voting on something and I was the only one voting against it. And uh, somebody said, I, I really missed an opportunity because my thoughts were that uh, looking at him and say, why don't you just look up on the board? Maybe that tells you something, but th that wasn't of my nature. So I hoped that somebody else looked up at the board and figured out w where that came from. So I, I liked that, but then I saw that uh, that's spontaneous movement which i was very happy for i don't think it's dead at all i tell no, you the truth no, the, no, the, no, no. the original intent there uh, because people still believe these things and i still uh, feel like uh, they're acknowledged when i go to the college campuses and they still they still want to hear that same message but uh, politicians tend to tend to want to take what they want <laughs> and, and say oh you know they're the tea party movement and uh, that's uh, that's that's it. it sounded good but uh and then then it's changed now but it looks like now they want to bury it for good <laughs> yeah. well the, the big difference is that you were excited uh, in 07 when you had the money bombs, when you had the college campuses, uh, you were excited about the, the ability to transmit the philosophy. The rest of them were excited about your ability to raise the money because <laughs> yeah. it was always only about that. And so they took that. But you know, the, the, the whole point of the Tea Party is it demonstrated the broad appeal 
that could not be uh, honed in, cannot be contained by the campaign itself. And I remember Kent sometimes complaining, uh, in Kent Snyder complaining, your first campaign manager, kind of half jokingly, is we can't get these people to do what we want them to do. <laughs> they can't be corralled. They were on their own. And that's where the energy was. And, if, and, and I know it's going to take a second because at the last minute I wanted to have a bonus clip. So if you can start searching for that, I'm sorry about that. But, you know, this is what the Tea Party started as. Uh, this is the beginning of the Tea Party. This is one of the first graphics. Here we go. Ron Paul, President, 2008. This is a YouTube video. The Tea Party started in 2007. Ron Paul is the godfather. This is a film, uh, YouTube about it. So that is the fact. Patriot Act, Iraq War, CIA, IRS, open borders, Federal Reserve. They're throwing these over the Ron Paul ship. This is the origin of the Tea Party. And I, I mean, I, I was thinking about this, Dr. Paul, you know, about defending the fact that you were the ideological godfather of the Tea Party. And this isn't about sour grapes on our part, because it's about dispelling the idea that there can never be a grassroots movement against interventionism, because that's why they are trying to rewrite history. That's never possible. You can't have that. But that's exactly what did happen. Now, you're telling me that the blimp most likely wasn't <laughs> originated by the campaign. <laughs> and all of a sudden, somebody did that and had it up there. <laughs> so, you know, but, which to me is, uh, I get excited about it, not because, you know, I'm getting a little bit of attention. I get excited about it because you already mentioned it, that the ideas can't be stopped. You know, the, the, the guns of government can't yeah. stop us. We, I'm just hoping that we can work hard enough to make sure that the authoritarians that are in charge in both parties who would like to silence their political opponents yeah. and that's what's going on now and uh, a lot of threats and innuendos because most Americans though are all already on our side because they don't believe the government anymore yeah. and uh, and they don't think the court system is fair and so this is the and and right now we can look and say we well you know th this whole thing about the speakership may have come down on one item in foreign policy and it was narrowed down to eight votes yeah. and money. Now, a lot of people are saying, don't say anything nice about that. But, uh, but it, it was the, that was the issue. It was the money and there was a motivation. It'll be interesting to see how, how those eight individuals do to see if the people will you know, give them support. But I think that uh, the thing for us is, uh, it was the foreign policy that did it. Yeah. Not that not that the Democrats who came over and participated in, in this little episode, because uh, there's a lot of pragmatism thrown together, so you can't can't say it was all this or all that. But I, I think it's a very very interesting that the people uh, were dealing with a foreign policy issue, and I saw a lot of them felt very strongly about it. And we still have a job because uh, we need to refine that too, because uh, you know getting sick and tired of the filthy waste in going to, to, to into Ukraine and protecting nobody, not their sovereignty or our sovereignty, our money, the, the whole work. It's it's uh, not that. It's 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 how the, how how are they going to respond to to uh, this when it comes to voting? You mm -hmm. know, are they going to? Yeah, uh, because some of them say, well, I'm glad we're doing this because it's all a waste, but. The real enemy. Yeah. They have the real enemy lined up already. <laughs> yeah. So it's not that's pure. a keep up. But we do have to, I hate, I, it's rare that I counsel you to be optimistic because it's usually the opposite. But for the first time ever, a speaker was brought down and it was brought down over the issue of interventionism yeah. and foreign policy. So, yeah, we'll take the Dems and all of their conniving, what have you. Still, we have to revel in that fact that this was an issue and it remains an issue. If, if you don't mind, I just want to finish one last thing on our favorite Harvard professor and expert on the Tea Party. Because here's something else that she said in the interview on Politico. If we can put that next one up. Now, I'm not going to read this because it's, it's boring and hard to read. But essentially what she's saying is that the entire Tea Party was a project of the Koch network. The Koch network outflanked the Republican Party. They brought a lot of pressure. The young guns were in tune with that. So... According to this professor, the whole Tea Party movement was the Koch network identifying these three young guns and giving them a bunch of money uh, to run, and now it's finally over. Well, this is the very same Politico that in 2012 ran the next article, if we can put that next clip. 
This is back in 2012. Even their own paper, Politico, said Ron Paul and the Tea Party playbook and go into that article, which is the next clip. And this is 2012 in Politico. The Republican National Convention this week announced speaking plots for Libertarian Senator Rand Paul and Social Conservative Rick Santorum. Both claim the Tea Party brand. However, the 2012 primary season reveals that the Tea Party playbook is more Paul than Santorum. Oh. So the same Politico gives you the proper This, this is real recent. No, that's 2012. Oh, that's okay. 2012. So 2012, you are, the key, you are the playbook of the Tea Party in 2023. You don't even exist in a lengthy article about the Tea Party. Well, so. you know, I said earlier that uh, the, the way this was getting put together, it was inevitable that as the takeover occurred and control of the message of the, of the Tea Party movement, that it was doomed to fail. And I think it's not complicated because I think the people that were taking over were uh, interventionists, mm -hmm. and I think they were neoconish, and they were very much involved. And so their philosophy, and they thought, well, this is just one little thing because in a way they didn't attack me on the Federal Reserve. No, no. You, you yeah. know, that went by. But when it, when it came to this foreign policy, it might also be just another reflection of the power and how vigilant the uh, military industrial complex uh, really is. I mean, they, they, they probably don't miss very much at all, even down to a minor seat. You know, they're going to be they're going to be very much involved. And the think tanks that made a ton of money claiming the Tea Party mantle also made a ton of money from the military industrial complex. Yeah. So I think that's why they soft pedaled a lot of that. As soon as it became popular and they realized they could mail on it, which is what it's all about, being able to mail on something. Well, that's when they said, OK, we are totally 100, well, not 100 percent, but almost 100 percent Tea Party. There's just one little butt, or as you'd say, there's one big butt and everyone has a big butt. Um, so that's what happened, unfortunately. Yeah. And I think for the uh, people who opposed us uh, had to do something to undo the popularity of the real Tea Party movement without being too personal about it. They yeah. went to, they, they, they did because I, when I started asking questions about people that, you know, maybe at a gold conference, they could have been, uh, you know, go either way, but uh, I'd ask them and uh, they, they were t too often saying, well, we, we have to have to have a strong national security, you know, yeah, yeah. You know, that sort of thing. Which you would argue, of course we do. That's why we shouldn't be spending money on ridiculous That's why we have to try to save the dollar. Yeah, you know? and save, uh, protect our own country. Yeah. Well, anyway, this chapter remains to be written. Someday we'll have to have uh, Norm Singleton on to talk about it because he was more in the middle of it than, than us eggheads in the back were during the, during the time. But let's move on because this is a related article. And this is also from Politico. Hey, we're giving them some love and some criticism, so it's even. Let's go to the next one because this is what we both noticed this morning. Ukraine is freaking out as McCarthy chaos threatens USA. The Ukrainians now who have been attached at the teat of the U.S. government now for the past year and a half or more, of all of a sudden realizing that as much as you want, as long as it takes, doesn't mean what they think it means. Go to that next clip from the article because now they're seeing that Days after lawmakers shelved a vital U.S. plan to send billions of dollars to Ukraine, McCarthy was ousted by Republicans and Ukraine was named as one of the reasons. Now here's a quote. In Kiev, officials are at a loss as to what might happen next. Their staunchest military ally suddenly looks unreliable. Despite assurances from President Biden that the U.S. will remain steadfast, and Ukraine until Ukraine's invaders are defeated. All of a sudden, it's not so sure. You know, in, in this title to this thing caught my attention because uh, the at Kiev that Ukraine has become a tool, a tool of the U.S. domestic politics. Well, when did that happen? It yeah. didn't happen this week. Yeah. You know, it, it happened when uh, they rolled over and they wanted to play with the big guys and they wanted to be involved in NATO. They wanted to line up the battles and, you know, do all this stuff and join the military industrial complex. They're still trying to get more involvement. They, they want to be man. They're, they're lining up to uh, set the, the Ukraine country for manufacturing weapons and things. 
the, the whole thing is, is though, uh, are they really helping themselves? Are they helping the uh, sovereignty of their country? Are they helping the Europeans? Are they, dis are they damaging Russia as much as they like? Uh, fortunately, they're not destroying Russia as, as they attempt to. Uh, they can blow, blow up their pipelines, but uh, it seems like they've been able to recover from that. But uh, it's a it's a real pity that uh, they, they they all of a sudden are surprised. How how did this happen? They're not they, they become a tool. Yeah. We don't we don't want to be a tool of yeah. them. Yeah. And yet yet uh, you know it's uh, uh, they are a tool of us and it's a tool of the empire, which is the um, in, in the independent you know that run run uh, the deep state and the globalist po policies that's uh, that's who's really in charge and and uh, so therefore uh, there are still a lot of good things about what's going on in this country and uh, with the people and we talked about a little bit of it here uh, but uh, it's it's uh, something that it's the message and the ability and the right to deliver a message and that is where I consider a real Real serious threat because people are getting threatened uh, if they if they speak their piece uh, too often, like ever. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we we are critical of Ukraine's top leadership in the way they always are demanding money, but at the same time, you can't really just blame Ukraine for the situation because, in fact, they are being used as a tool. They're being used as a tool by the neocons here and the neocons in the EU for their long-standing fantasy of destroying Russia. And they're, that, they're the battlefield. That's where the blood is flowing. They're the ones sacrificing themselves for the neocons. And we heard it yesterday, remember when we talked about the Dutch, the Dutch foreign minister who said, well, this is a cheap way to get at Russia. 500,000 people dead is a cheap way? I mean, talk about life being, I know they have euthanasia and abortion and all sorts of things in the Netherlands, but I guess that's what happens when you start believing that life is cheap. It's not worth anything. Yeah, now, now they're getting skittish because they see the end might not be exactly what they thought, but there were people around uh, and friends of ours were making the point that this is foolish. It, even, even if you think it should be done for moral reasons, it's foolish, it's not gonna work. And I think the failure of it was inevitable from the beginning and it's so evident now that even Biden is, you know, mincing his words a little bit, yeah. you know, and so how much can we do? Because the people will rebel eventually. And I, that's why it's part of that first sec section that we just talked about. The people have made, you know, those dollars going to U Ukraine in that, uh, you know, special funding uh, is, is so important because that is what uh, led to the changes in, in, in Washington. So, uh, that that is that is good, but we have to develop a system. We have to get them to talk more. What I mentioned a minute ago, the difference between interventionism and non-interventionism, and you can't have balanced, you know, modest approach. I, I always get annoyed about this non. Uh, you, you, you know, if you if you have an intervention, what you need is cooperation. You need a balance. You need uh, you you know need bipartisanship. You need to give up something. Give up half of what you believe yeah. in. <laughs> so that's that's the that's the tragedy. Because if you give up half of what you believe in, that's a hundred percent of the whole process. Yeah. Well, I think what's happening is that the tide has now turned. This is the turning point. This week is the turning point, and I think it's because it's now become obvious that this whole operation has been from the very beginning a U.S. neocon operation, starting certainly obviously in 2014, but before that. This is a U.S. neocon operation, and the ridiculous Europeans have allowed themselves to be drug along by the nose ring behind the U.S. neocons who've always gotten everything wrong, everything <laughs> they touch turns to garbage, and I think one of, the, one of the, uh, the, the pieces of evidence of this fact is skip a couple of clips and go to that next Politico article about the EU. And this is what makes it very obvious that now even the Europeans are realizing. And here's an article from today, Dr. Paul. EU to US, help, we can't cope without you on Ukraine. <laughs> All of a sudden they're looking around and they're seeing that Washington's, the possibility of support dropping from Washington leaves them holding the bag as the neocons always do dr paul it's always someone else's fault it's never their fault and i found this graphic to to, to demonstrate exactly what it means we can't cope without you put on that next graphic because this shows how much 
Project Ukraine is a U.S. neocon operation. Look at this. The country is sending the most military aid to Ukraine. Now look at the U.S. on the left. Now this is a dated chart, but the proportions are still the same. The U.S. in billions of dollars, 46.5. The next closest is the U.K. at 5. So we're talking 10 times as much U.S money going into Project Ukraine than the next highest supporter. This is a U.S. neocon project and with it being more obvious that the bottom has fallen out of the neocon money train, it looks like the project is dying. You know, is, is it uh, overstating it to say this is stupid? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think it's stupid, but then you say, well, why do they do stupid things? They're gamblers. Yeah. Because, and I think one is, there's people who, who are enamored by power and control and empires. And uh, the money is necessary, but the money is secondary to power. That's what they feed on. So they, there's the people who seek empire and, and power. And also then there, there are the people who are much more mercenary and say, well, we, got, we have to make a buck. Yeah. You, you know, so there, there's a money involved and uh, that's, that's, you know, the motivation. But the question we don't ask enough nor try to understand and explain. Uh, right now, we explain why people are sick and tired of it and they're coming our way. But I always keep asking, why, why do we have to wait so long? And I, yet I've even pointed out that they, they woke up a little sooner over Ukraine than they did at Vietnam. Yeah. Vietnam was much more tragic uh, of what was happening, uh, that, what's happening here. But it's still, and that's why I think, I think the founders understood the difficulty in it and the shortcomings of war and all these things. I don't think they were naive, but uh, in, a, in a way, uh, their efforts uh, didn't solve the problem. And, uh, and you know, this, they, they ended up saying, oh, well, you, you got to live in the real world and you had, there's times, but we, we were never really non-interventionists, you know. Uh, but we can afford to be non-intervention if, we, if, we, if we're so powerful. We, we are powerful, but, uh, but, it, but you know, the, the policies are destined to curtail us. It's not going to be, you know, getting a few more people in Congress, I think we should if we can because they have a voice, but that, that isn't going to do it. It's going to be when the people say enough is enough. The people, in a way, spoke out and allowed foreign policy to become an issue in getting rid of the speaker. Yes, and that's why they're so afraid of movements like the Tea Party movement. They're yeah, there afraid you go. <laughs> of these populist movements. Well, I think we've probably covered it all. I think maybe it's time to close out now, Dr. Paul, if you're ready. And I would just do that by thanking our audience thanking all of our viewers on whatever platform you watch this program. Of course, we're live on Rumble at this point. Um, so if you can subscribe, if you can hit like, if you can make some comments, whatever platform you're on, it'll help us grow the show and we appreciate it. And it won't cost you a penny. So that's a great way. And if you're not subscribed, please do subscribe. Um, I have some details in the description about how to get Ron Paul's brand new book, but I'll leave it at that and turn it back over to you, Dr. Paul. Very good. And I want to express my deep appreciation to all our viewers for tuning in to the Liberty Report. And uh, we're anxious to meet and hear from as many as possible when we do live streaming. And at times we have a lot of viewers. Uh, unfortunately, yesterday our numbers were down a bit, but lightning struck. It was an act of God that slowed us up and we had to, but it didn't stop us because we got together. Something is on the website from our program yesterday, but we really did have a bad storm. And you know, I, every once in a while I make statements, not purposely thinking I can predict anything, but I said, you know, we've been a drive for eight months here. I says, wait till it comes. After about two days of hard rain, we're going to say, when are we going to see the sunshine? So uh, we're going to see the sunshine in, uh, in our philosophy and what we believe in. And we're going to see our sunshine when we realize that, uh, that monetary reform is required and that there's a real important issue when you talk about devising a 
government that's mo motivated by intervention versus non-intervention. Interventionism is been, has been around for all of history. Non-intervention is a rather new idea, and uh, it's, it's something that uh, doesn't mean that we can't have it. I mean, the whole world is a new idea when you compare to how old the universe is. So uh, freedom, is, freedom is new in, a, in many ways, and freedom is very popular when people get to know what it really is all about, and that is why we here at the Liberty Report try our best to express what liberty really means and get people to join us. I want to invite everybody to return to, to the Liberty Report soon.